Uh, so I've been down. I've been at University of Kentucky for a few years now. I did start my career at University of, of Maryland. I spent nine years there working on water quality. Moved to Kentucky and, and have, have pretty much focused on, focused on uh, precision nutrient management. But it's good to be here. It's been a few years uh, since I was up here at this conference, but it's always a good conference. Good good speakers and. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about precision phosphorus and uh, potassium management. How many people are doing uh, variable rate P and K? Somewhat, yeah. So um, most uh, research indicates or, or surveys indicate that 40 to 70 percent of the P and K in North America is applied variable rate. Okay, somewhere between 40 and 70. That's a big swing. So I, I usually go with. Half of its variable rate applied, and, and I think my experience kind of kind of falls in line there. If you think about the big the big uh, row crop acres uh, through the Corn Belt, and the question uh, really becomes based on what. And so, uh, this is something I've been kind of beating this drum. Some of you may have seen me give this talk before, um, or similar about this issue that we're doing variable rate P and K, but the question is, what's the agronomy behind it? So uh, I was sitting in the back of the room here with Dr. Fulton. Uh, uh, he told me that while I'm in states where people know him, I'm not allowed to say he's a friend of mine. Um, and I always say the engineers, uh, they made the tools that allow us to vary the rate of nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, lime, nitrogen, right? They made these great tools so we can, we can vary the rate. Um, but as agronomists and soil scientists like myself, uh, we never developed recommendations around precision ag. So that's kind of the spoiler for this talk. The take home message is, I think we're varying a lot of nutrients across the landscape incorrectly. Because they made these, this great hammer, right? And when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And unfortunately, I think we're beating on a lot of screws with the tools that the engineers made for us. Cause, cause as soil scientists or agronomists, we didn't develop those recommendations. When we talk about soil testing, I'm going to get into some of the background before I kind of move forward into, into the precision part of it. But when we talk about soil testing, it's really four separate components that make up the soil testing process. The first is, so, is soil sampling. And traditionally, when, when we give a soil fertility talk, we'd always say this is the limiting function. Are you adequately representing the entire field? Are you consistent in the depth of sample that you're taking, right? Are you handling that sample appropriately because junk in, junk out as far as soil testing goes. Your recommendations are only going to be as good as the soil sample that got sent off to the lab. Uh, and when we do variable rate, we're actually probably doing a better job of soil sampling because we're probably taking a lot of soil samples. And as we get into this talk, that's kind of be one of the take-home messages, that one of the things we did right was take more samples, okay? So we're going to do a grid sample most often to support variable rate P and K. Um, you can also do zone management, maybe grid point or, or, or grid cell, and we'll get into that a little bit. We're pretty good at soil analysis. Uh, soil testing is crude. Uh, I heard Ohio is moving into the 21st century and going to start using Malik 3. Is anyone, is Steve Coleman in the room? Yeah. yeah um, so I hear the tri-state is, is going away from, from Bray, which was actually just an estimated Bray, and they're going to join the rest of the, uh, you know, free world in, in using Malik 3. Uh, but soil analysis, it doesn't matter what test you use. We'll talk about that a little bit, but the chemistry, you know, it's crude, but it's good enough for, for soil testing, and we're pretty good at that. We have proficiency testing to make sure all the labs are generating the same number. But this is where the rubber meets the road. So you got a high quality soil sample. You went to a good lab that uh, participates in proficiency testing, and then we've got to interpret that result and make recommendations. And this is where we, we've fallen short of being able to do precision P and K management. I'm going to stay away from Lyme because, um, you know, it doesn't make a good story, So uh, because it probably works okay. So it's, it's, it's a lot more fun to talk about something that doesn't work. With Lyme, we have a, a buffer uh, test, pH, you know, whether it's Lyme requirement, whatever your lab calls it. And then we also measure pH. So we're measuring that active acidity and that buffer capacity with some sort of buffer test. And so those two tests give us increased precision in the recommendations to some extent. So we're going to stay away from that. We're going to talk about phosphorus and potassium. So as I said, 40 to 70 percent report VR, uh, nutrient management. Uh, so we can fertilize at that at a pretty fine resolution. Like we can do it, so we do do it. Uh, we need to be able to come up with a high-resolution characterization of spatially variable nutrient needs. So what is that? It's the map, the prescription. So we've got to go out and soil sample and make this map. 
I would say that we're not precisely mapping at the resolution uh, where, we're, where we're applying the nutrients. And we'll talk a lot about that. We have to interpret the soil test with matching precision. Now, notice I'm not talking about accuracy. and We're going to get into this uh, quite a bit. And recommend, recommendations have to be developed specifically for variable rate management. And we don't develop recommendations. No one's really developed recommendations around this. The last speaker is getting into that area of where I think we need to go to be able to have precision-based recommendations. So first, soil sampling. So precision ag is going to break the field up into smaller components, right? That's what we're trying to do. And most often, we're doing some grid sampling, okay? And so with grid sampling, you're going to do grid point sampling most often. Grid cell is when you would go across that two-and-a-half-acre cell, zigzag, and collect a, a, a composite sample for the, for the cell in its entirety, whereas grid point, you drive to that point, you collect 10 or 12 cores, put them in the bucket, mix them up really well, send them off to the lab. They represent each point, right? Um, grid sampling, typically, when I used to teach that grid sampling was good, uh, you know, it, it, it's good at, at identifying where previous management has altered soil nutrient levels. So uh, that area in the field that used to be an animal lot, or there's some human-induced change that's not natural dealing with the landscape position, it's going to pick that up. And, uh, you know, small fields, we've pulled out fence rows and combined them into larger fields. That's the real strength of grid sampling. Directed sampling is or zone sampling breaks the field up into some sort of zone and you collect an average sample for each zone. But it requires really high quality data to delineate these zones. And then we get into the question that we'll discuss later about how do you delineate those zones? What are you using to say this zone should be treated the same and this zone over here should be treated the same? Landscape position, soil texture, a lot of people use yield maps, things like that. It also requires a person individually to handle each field to delineate those zones. We don't have a good way to kind of batch process all of our fields. And since consultants, and I know there's probably many consultants in the room, this isn't uh, criticism, uh, because we're dealing with a lot of clients, or even an individual farmer is dealing with a lot of fields, the logistics of delineating zones within each and every field on an acre-by-acre -acre basis becomes too cumbersome, and so we go back and we push the easy button. Because I could put an 18-year-old kid on a four-wheeler with a Wintex automated soil probe and a grid map and send them out there and grid sample every two and a half acres or one acre if I'm being, you know, really overkill and, and get a really good grid sample very easily. It's the easy button. And all of the software has a button, interpolation. And I don't care whether you're doing inverse distance weighting or Krieging. It's all wrong. All right? And this is, this is where we're going to go off the rails. Your grid map that has been interpolated is incorrect unless you collected those grid samples on a grid tighter than one quarter acre. And that's not a criticism necessarily of grid sampling. It's just math, right? So you can argue with that, um, but you're just going to be wrong. It's like uh, when I'm in an argument with my wife, I'm just wrong, right? Um, and it's, it's just math. It's not, this isn't an opinion. This isn't agronomy. It's not soil science. When we do a grid sample, so here's kind of an example of why it's wrong. So we're going out to these known points on a two and a half acre basis or one acre. And then I'm trying to estimate that value in the middle, that purple value with the question mark. So I didn't collect a sample right there, but I'm going to, I'm going to guess what that is. And whatever method I use to interpolate is going to weight the points where I actually sampled. So the four in green more heavily than points further away, right? Somehow, it's basically an average, but it's a weighted average where it uses the nearest neighbors have the most influence on the predicted value at that unknown spot where I didn't collect a sample. So in this example that I created, you can see why this would be a problem. If these four closest ones have the biggest impact, and I've got one flyer there, 45, and the field average is about 12, I'm going to get an incorrectly high value. See, soil properties are stochastic. So that means on average they can be predicted. There's a trend line and it is accurate. But in every spot there's extreme variation that is random and so you can have a high probability of being incorrect. That's precision, okay? So we're trying to do precision ag, not accurate ag. A field average in this case would be very accurate. 
there's bias introduced when you try to interpolate on a subfield basis. So the first paper that kind of struck me with this, like I said, I used to go and do extension programming and I taught grid sampling because I pulled some extension bulletin from some land grant university that said it was okay and everyone else was doing it. If everyone's doing it, it must be okay. And then by accident, I kind of tripped across this paper and it ruined my life. So what they did is, this is meters down here on the horizontal axis, and this is the R value on the vertical axis. And just by definition to interpolate, you have to have an R value of about 0.3 for the interpolation to be correct. And as you can see, what they found is that on average at about 30 meters, which is a quarter acre, you hit an R value of 0.3. Out here at 100 meters, two and a half acre grid sample, you have no correlation between sample points. So your separation distance of two and a half acres or one hectare, your interpolation is useless. And you go, ah, but it's still better than when I was managing that field on a hoe, right? I've still taken a step forward. And that's the first comment I always get back. I'm still doing better. What you're doing better is you're collecting more samples. That works out. That's good. But if you click the interpolated, the interpolation button, the predictive values in between the known sample points are more wrong than the field average. They're further than, from the true value than the field average 95% of the time. And that's just by definition of the statistics. So here's two maps from a friend of mine up at Penn State, quarter acre grid, one acre grid. You know, we do this interpolation, we click the easy button, and we're predicting these values in between the points. And what the research showed uh, from the previous paper, the Lauzon paper, there's the reference there, uh, it's actually a pretty easy to digest paper if you actually want to read this for yourself or I can, I can give you the, the, the reference later. Um, what they found and what others have reproduced since is this. That because of the stochastic variation in soil properties, if I sit grid sample even on a one acre grid and I average those points, 95% of the time that average will be closer to that unknown value. So I go to that spot and I now collect an actual sample where I was trying to interpolate the value, I have that sample analyzed, that value will be closer to the field average than what the interpolation predicted 95% of the time. So unless your field has extreme uniformity, interpolation on a grid, coarser than quarter acre, is just simply wrong. So that's the sampling part. It has pushed us away from, from, from precision. And that's because interpolation is, is accurate on this course scale, but it's imprecise. And this is like our recommendations. University recommendations get criticized all the time. Uh, folks say, and even private sector recommendations get criticized. They say, I wish my fertilizer recommendations were more accurate. They are, in fact, accurate. If you did a, a on-farm research trial uh, on 20 fields for 10 years, so you have 200 site years of data, on average, your nutrient require would, requirement would match the recommendation. It's accurate. In every year, in every field, it would be wrong. It's imprecise. Uh, we have a, a faculty member in our department that teaches a statistics class, and he hangs up little cartoons every semester when he's teaching that class to recruit students. I personally thought statistics sold themselves. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with kids today that he has to make it fun to try and get them to take statistics. But um, And in this cartoon, he's got three hunters. And he's relabeled them. The, the one on the left is a soil scientist. The one on the right is a plant scientist. And the one in the middle is the statistician. And in the first frame, that soil scientist shoots and misses a yard to the left. It wasn't me. It was Chad Penn in the back of the room. Um, and, and misses a yard to the left. In the second frame, the plant scientist shoots and misses a yard to the right. And in the third frame, the statistician jumps up and says, got it. Right? And that's what we're doing in ag. On average, we hit that deer. In reality, we never touched it because every year in every field, we're wrong. And because our recommendations were designed, the statistics we used, ANOVA, complete randomized block design, uh, replicated plots, three years, three sites, were designed to create an accurate representation of the average nutrient need. And if we're doing precision ag, we have to be more concerned about that distribution, the spread around that mean line and chasing the actual value as we move through space. And we may have to give up some accuracy to get there. I'm not sure at the end of the day how we're going to do it. So this is the other part where uh, I tell you that you're not going to learn anything in the next um, 
what do we got? Uh, 30 minutes. You won't learn anything because, because we don't have the answers I think we need to do precision ag. Soil analysis, like I said, generally we do a pretty good job, but this does factor into how we do precision ag. So, you know, soil basically has this long to short term storage of nutrients, P and K, whether it's minerals, organic matter, exchangeable nutrients, and then soil solution is what the plants are getting after, right? And so, the relationship between the total quantity of nutrients and what is plant available is what we call the quantity intensity relationship or the buffer capacity, right? So it's the pool that is feeding the soil solution, okay? And so when we take a soil test, because there's all of these factors that affect the quantity intensity relationship, soil testing can only provide an index of the potential nutrient supplying capacity of that field. It's accurate, it's not highly precise. It's just kind of a guess of what's in the background that's feeding. And you know, there's multiple soil tests, and sometimes people, when they see a soil test isn't dead on right, very precise, they start to criticize the test, and they say, well, Bray was better than Malik 3, or I used base cation saturation ratio instead of Malik 3. That's what was wrong, and these different kind of concepts out there. But in fact, the extractants don't matter that much when we talk about soil testing for accurate ag. For, for field management, the soil test just did it, that you're, you're extracting from these kind of discrete pools, and, uh, and it's the correlation and calibration of that soil test that make it useful, okay? So the soil test is only as good as the correlation and calibration data set. Now, when you talk about big data and sharing uh, information across state lines, then it becomes important that something like Ohio State moving towards Malik 3, because then they're using the same extractant, and perhaps Ohio and Kentucky in the border area were more alike than we are different, and we can share correlation calibration data to come up with a more robust test, right? So that's, that's where that extractant becomes important. As we move it into the, re, the interpretation, that's that correlation. So this is an example of correlation data. This isn't real data. I, I tell uh, some of my younger extension colleagues, uh, don't allow uh, data to get in the way of a good story, right? Because if I showed you real correlation data, there'd be massive scatter around the mean. So, you know, as soil test result goes up, relative yield goes up. And relative yield is simply unfertilized check divided by fertilized check. Two plots next to each other. One has 120 pounds of P205. Another has no P205. And if the check yields the same as the fertilized plot, you're going to be up here with a relative yield above 0.95. And we basically are going to do something like a Kate Nelson analysis to find that point where you hit that transition and relative yield is at 95%, right? And so correlation tells you the point on the soil test scale above which I don't need fertilizer. So that's correlation. And any kind of test that you're going to make recommendations off of, whether it's a plant tissue test, Sensor data, I see articles all the time about how we're going to take satellite imagery and make fertilizer recommendations. At the end of the day, you still have to have correlation for that data. Whatever value you're measuring, at which point on that scale did you no longer respond to fertilizer inputs? That's correlations. Pretty simple procedure. Separately, we can do calibration, right? So calibration is how much fertilizer do I need? And so I would have multiple fields, soil tests of 10, 20, 30, right? And here's the kind of take-home message of this figure, and, and a lot of people don't understand this, that, you know, so we add multiple fertilizer rates at different fields with different soil tests, and we look at yield or relative yield, and we can pretty much maximize yield regardless of what the soil test is. We just have to apply more fertilizer, right? So I can get there. I can get to max yield. I don't necessarily have to build the concentration in the bulk soil to maximize my yield. After I give talks recently, everyone has come up to me, and said, how do I get 612 bushel corn, right? Everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say 612 bushel corn, Dave Lowell, right? So 612. We can all get 612 bushel corn now. That is, we now know what our yield potential is. It's 612. That's what our yield potential is. And I can assure you it's not nutrients. I went into soil fertility because I tested too low on the aptitude test to do anything else in agronomy. All right? Just... Here's my recommendation. Anyone with uh, the Department of the Environment in Ohio earmuffs, just apply more, right? If you think that nutrients are the reason you don't have 612 bushel corn, just put 400 pounds of nitrogen down, 300 pounds of phosphate, and you'll still have the same yield as what you got last year, generally. It's not nutrients, okay? We can get there if we know what the sufficiency rate is. 
So the sufficiency rate is that amount of fertilizer required to maximize yield, and the sufficiency rate goes up as soil test goes down. So that's calibration. But when we talk about precision ag, the problem is that variability, right? So when we were doing accurate ag, if I just plot that trend line and look for the average where I hit the break point, where I look at the average across multiple sites, and that's my fertilizer requirement, that was good. It was really accurate. But every one of those fields in every single year of those calibration studies had a different yield maximizing rate, and we haven't talked about that. And in fact, we didn't secure that data because most of the correlation and calibration work was done decades ago, and it was stored on hard copies in a filing cabinet in the basement of the agronomy building that has since been thrown out by the department chair to make room for the new faculty. That's the reality of the situation is we don't have the historical data to know what that spread is around the optimum fertilizer rate or that spread around the critical level. And this is what becomes important in making our recommendations for Precision Act. So we have this these kind of three philosophies currently in accurate ag. I'm not going to talk about base cation saturation ratio. I know it has a strong following in Ohio, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm going to talk about the science-based approaches, which are sufficiency and build and maintain, and the hybrid approach, OK? So you've got this sufficiency approach, which is just apply what you need to maximize yield. And I already said we lost the data for what exactly the sufficiency rate is. Then you've got true build and maintain, which is I want to rapidly build to the critical level and then I'm always going to apply crop removal to maintain my soil test. Okay? Very few people do true build and maintain. We're doing some sort of hybrid approach in between because, you know, basically soil doesn't pay interest. So rapid building, big building of soil tests doesn't pay back because I know I can maximize yield this year by just applying what the crop needs, right? And so what this graph shows is this is a curve for Kentucky of kind of soil buffer capacity for phosphorus. I've got initial soil test P on the horizontal axis. Fertilizer rate in pounds per acre on the vertical axis. And the blue line is the rate required to move soil test 10 pounds per acre or 5 ppm. Okay? So if my soil test is below 5, I need 600 pounds of phosphate to move 10 ppm or 10 pounds per acre or 5 ppm. Obviously, that's not economically smart. So UK uses kind of a hybrid. We recommend about 200 pounds of phosphate per acre in that range, right? And then we kind of move down here, and we're pretty close to that kind of build. So in this mid-range, we're actually right there at what it would take to move 10 pounds per acre. And then we get out here past our critical level, and we're still making a recommendation, but it's pretty low. It's 30 pounds P205 per acre, where we don't expect any yield response. So we're not true sufficiency. We're making a maintenance recommendation above our critical level, which is somewhere around 40 pounds soil test. All right, so that's that's 20 ppm. That's our critical level. 27 is actually our our critical level. But somewhere in here, we're saying you don't need any more fertilizer. Our our calibration or our correlation data says you don't need any fertilizer. We're still recommending 30, and that's just kind of an insurance because when we were doing accurate ag, we knew there was uncertainty and there was variability in soil tests across the field. So we our recommendations, even though everyone thinks university recommendations are too low. Our recommendations are somewhere around twice what you need to maximize yield. Okay? And that was insurance for accurate act. So sufficiency, we lost the data, but my guess is it looks something like this. And these are actually our recommendations at UK, right? So we have this much greater recommendation above the yield maximizing rate. There's our critical level. So build and maintain ignores and even our hybrid approach at the university ignores the buffer capacity of the soil. All right? Soils don't pay interest, so I'm applying 200 pounds per acre at the low end hoping to build, but I'm not doing anything for yield with 140 pounds of that fertilizer. So I'm spending money on 140 pounds of P205 that is not returning any yield, but I'm hoping that 20 years from now. But if I'm really low on soil tests, this data tells me it may be 50 or 60 years before I recover that investment. So over 60 years, if I take 140 pounds of P205 money at about 40 cents a pound of P205 and put it in a savings account, even at 1% interest that we're getting now in high yield savings accounts that, that's garbage, it's still going to pay me more than putting that in the soil. Again, this is getting to this kind of precision concept of what is that rate that would match a precision system. 
And I think that, you know, because we know we have this kind of iceberg effect, right, that's that buffer capacity for K and P205 especially in the soil. So when a crop takes up nutrients, fertilizer, soil phosphorus, there's this reserve that's in storage that we're not measuring that backfills. So even when my soil test is five, that iceberg kind of floats up and refills the extractable. So when I'm at really low soil test, I can crop for many years, and the drop in soil test is not equivalent to what I'm removing with the crop because that iceberg is floating up and refilling that plain available pool, right? But our current recommendations with this big build component sort of ignore that this is important for precision ag. And so I think for precision ag, my, my hypothesis is, is that we're going to want more frequent soil testing and lower rates that are closer to sufficiency. Now, because of uncertainty, we still want to offset on the high side and be slightly above sufficiency. But first, we have to be able to establish what sufficiency is. So we need to know that yield maximizing rate. It's probably, you know, we know it's definitely less than build and maintain. And a friend of mine in the fertilizer industry, and, and this may be self-serving, but I actually think there's some value to what he, what he offered. He said, you know, you don't know what the sufficiency rate is, and you're saying the build and maintain is way more than what I need. Like, here's maintenance on a roughly 200 bushel corn crop, 60 pounds of P205, so about 180 bushel corn crop is going to remove 60 pounds of P205. And you're saying your sufficiency is down here somewhere under 60 pounds per acre. Um, until you figure out what sufficiency is, would a precision recommendation of removal rate, 60 pounds, be about right? And I said, yeah. But I wouldn't use yield to do that. I would just do 60 over the whole field. And so we're back to doing accurate ag again. Um, but we've got to figure out what that sufficiency rate is if we want to do precision ag. So this is where we're at. I've kind of broken down all the things we don't know. So we started saying, OK, this is what we don't know. How are we going to move forward? What can we do? So the last few years, you know, I started thinking about, well, five phosphorus rates randomized in five blocks at four locations for three years. This is how we built our existing correlation and calibration data sets, right? And if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're going to keep getting the same answer. So what the university does, and the private sector too, I'm an equal op opportunity criticizer, is we like to break our arms patting ourselves on the back. So every three or four years as a soil fertility specialist, um, my commodity boards come to me and they say, our yields have gone up, your phosphorus recommendations haven't, we need to reevaluate the recommendations. So we do this study, we say our recommendations are still good, and we go on. And we keep doing that every three, four, or five years. We keep proving ourselves right. But what we haven't done is move forward into a precision paradigm, right? And so I would argue we need some sort of new research design to get at a precision recommendation. So what we did, and I'm not saying this is entirely right, there's some shortcomings in the strategy, was we went out to a field and we set up uh, 40 foot grids. So each one of these squares is 40 foot by 40 foot. And we're using a four row corn planter, so 10 foot wide. And we go in there and we have 40 foot long, 10 foot wide subplots in each one of these dots, right? And we randomly select, we put the grid over the whole field, randomly select a third of the field in the first year because we want to look at some different things. And we shotgun those plots across the field. And then the next year, we pick up another third and go back to our old ones. And so we're looking at some lag and different things. But within that grid, we do with and without. So I've got two passes with and two without, just as a prescription variable rate. We're using two by two because it's an easy way to manage it. We're using ammonium polyphosphate liquid in the two by two at 60 pounds of P205. And we're putting out about 50 pounds of nitrogen and we're balancing it so the whole field's getting the same amount of starter nitrogen coming in at V6 and side dressing the balance of the nitrogen. And we randomize in that 40 by 40 square where the two passes of the, of the phosphorus go. So we're running through the field and just turning on the poly, dropping back the UAN. And then as we come out of that plot, the UAN bounces back up. So this has been our strategy. Uh, we started this uh, in, what year is it, 2020? We started this in 2016, I guess. Um, I can't be right. We started in 2015 because this will be our, our uh, yeah, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, this is our sixth year. I'm not great at math. That's why I hang out with engineers. Um, so, uh, so, you know, our idea was to reduce the plot size to limit variability. Uh, two treatments, just with or without. 
uh, you know, just in the two by two to maximize the probability of response in these no, these were all no-till fields. And so the first thing we do is we go out at V4, all right? And so you got soil tests and parts per million in the top four inches. We also did uh, six inch samples out in the fields. And we say, okay, here's soil tests in, within these fields. Here's relative biomass. So biomass of the unfertilized plot divided by biomass of the fertilized plot at V4. Just how big are the plants? Well, the plants are a lot bigger when you use starter, right? But how many times have you heard the university extension uh, person say, you know, we make the plants bigger, but we don't see it in yield? So we measure V4 response, and there's our critical level, existing critical level at UK, 95% relative biomass. And we see that, yeah, using starter P on very low soil tests, it makes the plant a lot bigger. And on average across all the fields, this is one site just because it was the figure I grabbed, but across all the fields, we're up to about a 12 bushel yield response now. All right. So on average, if we had applied 60 pounds of P205 in the starter in all of these fields, which were selected because they're low soil test P, we're going to get about 12 bushels of corn. Right. So our recommendations were good. On average, we were right. We got 12 bushels of corn. Um, we're rotating with soybeans. The problem is when I plot the individual points, again, this is UK critical level, I had a 50-50 chance of it working. So on average, I got yield at each individual 40 foot by 40 foot plot. Coin flip was as good as soil test. 50-50. The ones that responded, responded to a degree that carried the mean. So on average, UK did a good job. Our soil test works. If you use our recommendations, let's assume you grid sample on a quarter acre, and then you make that map, and you take the soil test, and you just apply the recommendation of UK for that soil test level. In a precision setting, our recommendations, our soil test critical level, doesn't hold at the subfield level. On average, it works. But half of the time, you'll be applying fertilizer to a spot that doesn't need it. Probably not hurting yourself. But we're not just trying to get lucky with precision ag. We're trying to actually be more right than we were doing flat rate ag. What we did see is that, in general, the variability in response was much greater at lower soil tests. Again, this, this concept of looking at this variability. As soil tests went up, that that spread in response decreased. And we see this with nitrogen as well. With nitrogen, it's really very apparent that when I over-apply nitrogen, my yield variability goes way down. Because at the lower nitrogen rates, I'm relying on soil microbes to mineralize nitrogen, right? And you can't trust a bug. And so at, as I go down in nitrogen rate, I have this huge yield variability. You know, we, we are seeing with zero pounds of nitrogen, we're seeing over a hundred bushel swing in our nitrogen research plots that are set up similarly. And these are in fields where I am getting between a hundred and three hundred bushel yields with no nitrogen at an individual spot, but not on average. There's this huge variability in the field. So we focused on mapping soil P. The early work was all about grid sampling and proving that worked. And I'm going to talk about why it worked here in a second. But we just, you know, the engineers made a piece of equipment that could vary the rate. And then the agronomist came in and just took our recommendations that we knew were accurate, and we applied them to that grid sample, and we never bothered to read the statistical papers because, to be quite honest, they're boring. And as soil scientists, we don't understand them. And so we didn't pay attention to the fact that interpolation doesn't work, right? So we've got this mapping that's probably wrong, correlation and calibration that work well on average but fail when we go to a precision system. And then we find the critical level is varying in the field. So there's got to be some other covariate if we're doing precision act. My guess is it's root length. When I have really long roots, even if soil test P is low, because phosphorus is needed in fairly small amounts for a macronutrient, I have big root volume, lots of total root length, more cross-sectional area of root for diffusion to occur across, then I don't need the fertilizer, even if my soil test is five. Right? It's that rooting depth. And so maybe John needs to develop a sensor that measures topsoil depth better remotely, and I can use that as a covariate with soil tests that I measure on the fly with some sort of sensor that is mapping soil P in space denser than a quarter acre. Right? So there's going to have to be new technology 
to do precision phosphorus management. You're assuming cover crops give you more roots, but we can talk about that in a second. <laughs> so we had cover crops on all of these fields too, by the way. So this was corn bean rotation with a rye cover crop ahead of corn. Most of the time. A few years because of the wet weather, we didn't get our rye out. So this is where I try, and as you're trying to do, give you some semblance of advice, right? Because I used to just stop the talk here. We have no idea what we're doing. You're better off doing flat rate. And I thought, everyone kept saying, <laughs> so the worst talk I've ever seen. It's still going to be the worst talk you've ever seen, but there's going to be really bad advice at the end of it. <laughs> All right? So first, because I've got a second, why did it work? How do we go down this road? There's been papers since the 80s about grid sampling and variable rate. Right? How, how did we get here? So here's, here's, here's how we got there. When you soil sample, there's a hard left wall, zero. You can't have lower soil test phosphorus than zero. So in a field, the bell curve of samples, the number of samples versus soil test is skewed right. Okay? You go out and you grid sample on two and a half acres. Our recommendations are twice what you need to maximize yield. So cutting rate won't cost you yield. You vary based on this incorrect map. And because it's skewed left, on average, in most situations, not always, but most of the time, you cut rate 20% because of the bell curve skewing right. As you get into these spots in the field where soil test is higher, you do find those with grid sampling. So on average, you're varying the rate here, and the requirement was here. And so you were able to cut rate across the field, but never, for the most part, below the yield maximizing rate because of this relationship, because it's 50-50. And so by luck, you're just cutting rate in between what you need and what we were recommending before. So it's just a mathematical phenomenon that when the early studies were done and they did grid sampling, they made a prescription for the whole field, and then they dropped strips of what they would have recommended based on the average on top of that, and they compared those strips to the variable rate prescription. We didn't lose yield. We cut rate. Soil test was skewed right, and we were still applying more than we needed in general. So we were varying rate here. This is what we recommended before flat. This is what we required. It's varying but we were above that. So it was blind luck that it looked like it worked. So grid sampling. All is not lost. Keep your grid data. I gave this talk at InfoAg. How many people are familiar with InfoAg? So there's like 200 people in the room, and they all get paid to take grid samples. And the first question I got the first time I started talking about this data was, you realize all of us get paid to grid sample, and you just called us all a liar. <laughs> no, the statisticians are the liars. Just find someone else to blame, right? Um, we just didn't know. Uh, you know, so grid sampling gives you a really good idea of the range and the median soil test value and the distribution. Is this field really variable or not very variable? Just don't interpolate. Just don't do this. Leave it as point data and look at your summary statistics. Mean. Standard deviation, median, which is less sensitive to the outliers, probably a better estimator of kind of the central tendency of the field. Use it if you try and do zones, which I understand logistically are problematic, but I think zones are the only opportunity we have to do better with precision ag right now. And so use your grid data to look at the central tendency of those zones, because you should have a couple points in each zone, and you can look at the mean for zone one, two, and three, the standard deviation, and then you can throw out a zone if you see there's a huge range. So if you have a zone, that zone, whatever software you're using to do your zone, we're using MZA uh, because it's free and we're cheap, uh, even though it was made for like Windows 3.1 or something. Um, it might find a zone and say, what makes all these parts of the field similar is that they're so different, right? And so, so if you have this huge range, you go, uh, what do we do with that? But use your grid data to look at the central tendency of your zones, or at least of the field. It's interpolation that is wrong. But the volume of data you have is instructional. 
I have a farm that has 18 years of one acre grid data. We've processed all that data and we're using it with the zones. We're trying to see if it tells us anything. If you want to back off of grid sampling, more frequent sampling is always better. I throw that in there because some people that own soil test labs might be in the room and I don't want them to get angry. Um, <laughs> but if you insist on grid sampling, because some people say, this guy doesn't look like he knows what he's talking about. And I understand that sentiment. I, I look in the mirror all the time and think, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Shift your grid over time to try and build that denser sample set over time, right? So if you're shifting that grid. It's zone sampling works, but it's, it's a challenge. Uh, we like, uh, and I'm glad the previous speaker, it looked like we might agree on this, topography, soil texture, even sometimes the historic grid samples, because I can use Varus to basically get soil texture. It's as good or better than NRCS data, kind of in a relative sense. That's what matters, right? Uh, topography, so slope, aspect, elevation, because the lay of the land basically determines soil type. And soil type tends to soil depth, uh, gives me my rooting depth, and, and so these are the things that those areas will, the side slopes will respond more similarly than the top slopes and the toe slope, right? And so we tend to use uh, elevation and slope and uh, soil texture if we have it. I do not use yield for P and K. This is very popular because, again, we have lots of yield data, and we don't know what to do with it. We've been collecting it since 1998, and we're like, this is, has to be useful to somebody besides, you know, big ag who's mining it to sell my rental rights or whatever, right? Um, so, so we, so we want to use it. I use it to test the zones because I think it's circular. Yield responds to nutrients. If I use it to predict nutrient need, I might be putting high nutrients on low yielding areas and they're low yielding for some other reason other than deficit phosphorus. And so they actually need less phosphorus because it's lower yielding. Or I may be putting like really high rates on high yielding areas and they're high yielding because there's really good rooting depth there. And that's what our data indicates. When I look at all those little point data, the ones that don't respond to phosphorus but have really low soil test P. I showed you relative yield. When I look at absolute yield, in the highest third yielding area of my field, I never respond to phosphorus fertilizer no matter what soil test is. The highest third yield, so that highest yield potential in my field, almost never needs fertilizer phosphorus. And I think it's the highest yielding area because it's got really big roots, right? So where'd that come from? I want to identify the soil health person. There we go. All right. That's a different room. We're not in a healthy soil here. Ne go next door. I got a beard, but I'm not a hippie. Come on. Just got a haircut. I'm talking about soil health. Get out of here. So we want to work on zones. We want to work towards zones, right? But it's tough, logistically. So we use this free software that's super wonky and hard to use, but we started a little project with some farmers in Kentucky, and then we got some funding from our wheat growers. And so by the end of this year, I'm hoping you'll be able to Google us and find this. You've got some really good tools coming out of the Ag Engineering Department here on Precision Ag and Zone Management Software. We're trying to do some tutorials using free software like QGIS and MZA. And what we'll do is they're going to be like three-minute videos, each one, bite-sized pieces, pieces, one video on downloading the software, one video on getting your data for free off the Internet, uh, these sorts of things, of how to build zones just simply based on topography, uh, various data if you have it, historic grid samples, building out these zones, testing them statistically. Your software that you pay for probably does it, but we use this free because that way it's an equal footing so everyone can test it and then go back to your own software. We're hoping to actually try it out with some of the commercial software and see how close it is to MZA, which is publicly available from the USDA, so we know the statistics it's running. But anyway, we're hoping to have these tutorials ready by the end of the year. We've started developing them. We're just kind of beta testing them with some farmers, trying to see if they can follow them. We thought about having some eight-year-old kids around the department uh, test them for us, but then we figured that, like, no, they're way better at computers than I am, so that would be, like, an unfair test. Um, but in future opportunities, even with a decent soil test, so if you go and you do the zone, get rid of your grid, you start doing the zone, our recommendations are coarse, right? And so what are you going to do? You're saying, well, you don't have precision recommendations for me. That's true. And so what's the advantage we have from precision technology? It's the ability to do some strip tests. 
So build your zone, put it in a high, low, and zero rate across that zone, and look at your relative response across the zones by zone, your average relative response in each one of your zones, to try and dial in. Start with whatever recommendation you have. It is a good starting point because it's accurate. So you have the zone, you get an average soil test value for it, you put that out and you put a 25% higher and a 25% lower and a zero, replicate that in your zones, and then look at the mean response because that's what Precision Ag allows us to do, is set up one or two fields as my research fields that I can monkey with and see how it's doing. And again, you've got some great on-farm research going on at Ohio State, and I'm sure your extension specialists would be happy to help you set that up. To practice precision ag, I think we need to get to closer to sufficient industry rates. So that's the other point that's kind of a take home here is realize that whether you're using private lab recommendations, crop consultants, or the university, they're above sufficiency. And I think to be truly doing precision, we need to be moving towards it, not pure uh, uh, sufficiency because we have to offset that risk of under fertilizing because grain costs more than fertilizer. But still, we need to move left a little bit because of that. So you've just endured 45 minutes of my manure pile. Um, are there any questions? I think we got about 15 minutes for questions. Yes. Josh, one thing that, that we're missing there too is baseline nutrient requirements assume the same efficiency across all farming systems and all soil types. And that's just not what we see. So the, the comment was that um, our baseline nutrient recommendations assume the same efficiency, so uh, transfer of nutrient to the plant across all farms and farming systems. Does that capture it? I didn't go into soil health. But I right, right, right. So, so we're trying to walk around soil health because, uh, my, you know, we don't want to talk about soil health in this room. But um, <laughs> that's correct, and that's the thing. I mean, our recommendations are this average. So half the fields in general need more nutrients, half need less, and that's just what you need, how you apply them and how your crop's growing. Root length, the bigger my roots, the more efficiency, the lower the recommendation that I need, particularly for phosphorus. I think potassium is the deficiency that I see increasing most across the landscape, and we see soil test K numbers dropping dramatically, and I actually don't think that's related to yield. If we think about how potassium is utilized and taken up by the plant, it gets back to a question of efficiency and the corn populations that we're planting. That in other words, the higher populations, because we all want to grow 612 bushel corn, and clearly 40,000 seeds per acre is how you do it. That was a joke. Um, that, that the higher population requires more K, regardless if my yield's going up or not. Yield's the same between 25 and 40K. But my K requirement goes up at 40K, at 25K, and get the same yield with less, because that K is going into the stock. Efficiency. How we're farming. It's different, so that your recommendations have to be tweaked on a site-specific basis. Yes? I was going to say the same thing, too, with your wine, but also the same thing controls your nutrient availability. So, I mean, if your pH is different in all those different spots, then your pH automatically assumes different goals based on your phosphorus something. That's right. I mean, so phosphorus availability, one of these fields that we went to, we were looking for really low soil test P fields. And when we went in and sampled, it was in eastern Kentucky down in the mountains. And that road, I guess, used to be dirt road down through those mountains, right? And they said, uh, you don't need to lime this field. The pH is good. And they showed me all their soil test reports. But this is where grid sampling benefits. Now, we were grid sampling on a 40-foot basis, so pretty tight grid sample. The average pH of that field was 6.5. And, and when we went across there and sampled every plot, it was about 7.5 up by the road. And down by the creek, as I went away from the road, it was about 4.4 4 was the average. Right? So when they went out and put a bunch of samples in a bucket and sent it off the lab, the average was 6.5 because they spent most of the time closer to the road, right? <laughs> Usually when I give this talk, people ask, you know, that, that talk, they say, how can I track the person doing my soil sampling? Um, you know, so they were zigzagging up close to the road and it biased that sample. And then we see this big response where the pH goes down because I can either lime it or I can add fertilizer. And same with K. We've done a study in forage production. How many people, I don't know if any people grow hay, but, but broom sedge. They always say if you, you know, lime, you get rid of the broom sedge in your hay field, right? So we did a study where we didn't add any lime. We were doing an NPK study. And just with potassium alone, we eliminate the broom sedge in those plots. And we had volunteer clover come in. 
right? And so what it was is, yes, if you lime, you will get rid of the broom sedge, but it's because the lime is making the K more available, right? Other questions or comments? Yes? Go back to that slide where you showed the R value propagation back to point Yes. Yeah, that's 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 a fan favorite. Uh where where is it? Did I did, did I it's way, way up here, right? Alright, there you go. Uh so these guys are up in Ontario, Agri Canada. Uh we've done the same thing in Kentucky. John Spargo did it in Pennsylvania, exact same results. Yeah, yeah, however many points are out there. That's I think each one of those points is a field. Um. Yeah, so I agree to your point. You know, it's uh, really important that we look into how we interpolate the data using great soil sampling. But uh, the assumption there is, like, you know, we're not using any secondary variables, like topography, like secondary Correct. soil sampling. Correct. You know, we are doing straight prigging or like in the IDW or something. Right, which is what uh, everyone's doing. There are other things that we could do with the great soil sample data, which is, you know, introducing regression variables like topography or soil texture or other properties, you know, that would get us closer to, to the reality. And that's, I agree that it varies from one field to another, it's going to vary from one field to another. And one of the speakers this morning, he talked about detail. And I think it's important that we look into that variable. So, map out, and rather than the is not so I'm going to try and repeat as much of that as I can. Um, the point was that this is if you grid sample and click interpolate, it's wrong. Fair? And what he was saying was if you put in covariates, so stratify your grid sampling, for example, by topography, so set up some sort of zone or use some sort of covariate, and then you basically Krieg by stratified zone or relational variable such as slope, elevation, soil texture. What's that? Root length if, you, if you're measuring soil depth, these sorts of things. That's correct, but whatever you do, you have to minimize your scale of inference to where your R value goes up, right? And the point is, I think in practice, 99.9% .9 of the grid sample data used in production agriculture is you push the easy button. You collect a one acre grid and you click interpolate on SMS, STS, Ag Leader, whatever you're running, right? Yeah, so the point, and so that's where we're trying to go is what are those covariates? Because we don't really know. And so that's kind of where our research is focused around, both in N, P, and K, is trying to find those covariates that we can zone out on and bring into that. Because everything you're doing is some sort of interpolation or extrapolation of that data. That, and you've got to have your scale of inference measure the strength of the relationship with distance. So your yield basically wasn't correct if you extrapolated the data based on the amount of dry matter for your cover crop, it didn't, didn't correlate the yield, so based on a fertility level, you didn't need more fertilizer on the less dense cover crop? So the question was, with dry matter of cover crop, could we use that to base fertilizer recommendations? In this phosphor study, we haven't looked at that. In our nitrogen study, we actually have looked at biomass of cover crop in relationship to nitrogen response. And we're finding that, in general, with nitrogen, it depends on the year. But that's exactly one of the driving factors. I mean, there's this huge range and variability in nitrogen requirement. And then if you throw cover crops into the mix, we need more nitrogen, right? Or at least it depends on the year. In a lot of sites where we're doing cover crop, no cover crop, you know, 45 nitrogen rates, and we're using a similar approach where we have zeros buried in every single plot. So we have hundreds of zero plots in the field. Um, we're seeing that the cover crop is driving a need for more nitrogen up front, right? Which is the carbon penalty mostly of the root biomass, right? Um, and so, you know, this past year, for whatever reason, even with additional nitrogen, we couldn't overcome the yield drag of the cover crop. So we had about a 25 bushel yield penalty across our sites on average with the cover crop, for whatever reason, the weather drove that. Normally we can overcome that yield drag, but we need more nitrogen to get there. We gotta pay, we have to pay the carbon tax, 